1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, a couple of <coughs> absolutes. Rejoice always. All right, got that one checked off. The rest ought to be easy. Actually, we covered some of these last week. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That is where we left off. We pick up now in verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. <coughs> verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. This word is used six times. This word quench is used six times in your New Testament. Everywhere else it is of fire. The Net Bible translates here, do not extinguish the spirit. Like a small child, when you are raising him or her, you do not want to quench the spirit of a small child. You want that spirit to grow up to be a stubborn spirit for the Lord. You don't want to quench that spirit. The same way, the Lord does not want to quench us to quench the spirit. Now, this means the Spirit wants to burn. I'm just using the metaphor. The Spirit wants to burn. Tell me, what does that mean? It wants to grow. It wants, it wants to, to grow. Alive. That's amazing. That's the first word I had written down. But I changed it. You're right. Spread. Grow, spread. It wants to be, uh, well... Yeah, go, go. Fire, uh, it wants to be your whole. The... Uh, consume all of you. He wants to consume. He wants to be an influence. <coughs> yeah. That's what it wants to be. It wants to be an influence. We sing a song occasionally. Shine, Jesus, shine. Lord, uh, basically there are two themes going through here. Or one, two general ideas that are connected. Love and truth. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Verse 2. Lord, I come into your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter into your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. And then, shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and with mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, let there be light. In the middle of that, blaze, spirit, blaze. We sing this song. So let me ask this question. How can the spirit be quenched? Is it just a feeling? That song is full of what we call emotive language. That's the purpose of that song. How, it wants to get you to feel this certain way. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Yes, I feel that. Okay, so when I don't feel it, is the Spirit not blazing? Is that what this is talking about? The context is king. <coughs> do not quench the Spirit. The next thought. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Hmm, I wonder what the connection could be. The short of it is, by not listening to him. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Okay, either your word is prophetic utterances or prophecy. It can refer to the act of prophesying, <coughs> which may have been the case. Maybe they had spiritual gifts there. I don't doubt it. Or it's the result of prophesying. The same word is used all throughout the New Testament talking about Isaiah prophesied and here's the prophecy. As I, so, so on. It doesn't matter if it's the act or the result. The idea is God's working. He's trying to tell you something. Don't not listen to him. Despise is the word that the tax collector, when he was praying to himself, he looked at other people with this word, contempt in the New American Standard. Don't. It's the word that folks had for Jesus when he was on the cross. They were despising and mocking him. Here's God's word, don't you? This is what, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is what non-Christians, unbelievers, this is what the world, God has chose the despised things. Here's a test for you real quick. 
when God says something and you not only not like it, but you despise it, well, that tells you who you are or what you are. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Context continues. Abstain from every form of evil. When the prophet, basically this is saying, don't be gullible, right? Don't be gullible. You remember this word here, examine, is our word in 1 John chapter 4, test the spirits. Do not believe everything. Test the spirits. The word uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, abstain from every form of evil. Romans 6. Turn to Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 17. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. In the original, it's actually two different words, but they're used synonymously. The teaching has a form. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he's saying, look, don't despise, don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophetic <coughs> utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. In the context, the form of evil is actually, specifically, false doctrine. Now, a couple things from this. Don't quench the spirit. Yes, when the spirit speaks, you listen. Test. Examine. The good, hold on to. The garbage, get false it. doctrine, get rid of. So let me ask you something. If you're mixed up in false doctrine, is that good for you or bad? What are you doing in this context? Yeah, that was a dumb question, right? If you're mixed up in false, right? Yeah, everybody here knows the right answer. That's bad. What are you doing? You're quenching the spirit. I want to grow the spirit. I want to be an influence. But you aren't letting me. Because you're mixed up in this false doctrine. So be careful. Be careful where you go, who you listen to, what you grasp onto. Comments or questions here? <clears throat> Yes, uh, Jonathan first. The, the the test the spirits thing. I could be wrong, but I think we we normally use a phrase like that and referring to something like someone comes in here and says, "Oh no, 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 we can use instrumental music," something like that, and we say, "Oh, hold on, that's something new. We have to test that and see if it is the case." Um, this though, being right after, do not despise prophecies, but test everything seems more like. Whoever he's writing to is more inclined to, you know, perhaps they're in a difficult situation, putting up a lot of persecution, something like that. And someone comes in and says, you know, you don't have to do this. That's making your life more difficult. And they would be very eager to grab onto that, um, you know, to despise or rephrase that. Someone comes in and says, you have to do this. That will make your life difficult. They would be eager to despise that because it would be a difficult thing to do. So rather than don't grasp onto this prophecy that would be easy to do, you know, test that spirit because you shouldn't be doing that. Here it seems more like don't grasp onto something that would keep you from doing something that is right. Is that making sense at all what I'm saying? Yes. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree too. Yes, some faces are like, what did he just say? And I'm not going to try to repeat it. The general idea is this. The general idea is this is a general principle. Yes, test the spirits. Examine every, examine everything. Somebody says something, something falls into, under or into everything. So it's a general principle. That's the way we use this very often. Very good. Jonathan's point is really what's being talked about here is, hey, you don't have to do that. That's making your life easy. Oh, because that's their situation. You don't have to, it's making, this is making your life difficult is what I meant to say. This is making your life difficult. I've got an easier way. Test it. Test it. Just because it's easier doesn't mean it's the right way. Not that I helped clarify what Jonathan said. <laughs> is that the only way the spirit can be quenched? By not listening to him? No, he says. You hide the truth or you do not spread the word. Hide or do not spread. Very good. The, the, the Spirit wants us 
to go and say, here, here's the Spirit. Here's the words of the Spirit. Here's the words. And when we don't, we're quenching the Spirit. What if the apostles in Acts chapter 2 mm, all ran out the door or stayed in the house, whichever you want to look at <laughs> in Acts chapter 2? What if they didn't do what they were supposed to do? That would have been quenching the Spirit. Sexual impurity. Now, I grant that not every verse I'm about to read has the word quench in it. 1 Thessalonians 4. This <coughs> is verse 3. This is the will of God. Your sanctification. That is, you abstain from sexual immorality. Look in verse 8. He who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gives you the Holy Spirit. So if you're not listening and you're messing around here, well, you're quenching the spirit. I know the word isn't there, but the concept is, right? General worldliness, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility to God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He who jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. God put us, put the Holy Spirit into us, and when we're friends with the world, however that might play out, but friends with the world, do not be deceived. Bad company is good for good morals. No, let me rephrase. Do not be deceived. Bad company quenches the spirit. Yeah. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. I want my moral to become better, but instead it's corrupting it. Well, corrupting and quenching both start with a hard C. Acts 16. Acts 16 Verse 6, they passed through the Ferdian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, uh, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus would not permit them. Do you remember a story where God said, he gave them directions. Oh, he knows where I'm going. God said, Jonah, go there. And what did Jonah do? Quenched the spirit. What if Paul had said, no, I'm going to Bithynia. I'm going. That's it. I'm going. He would have quenched the spirit because that's not what the, this is general. Anything we do. In fact, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily sin. Get, well, that's the obvious one. Get rid of the sin. And then there's also get rid of every encumbrance. It doesn't matter what it... Look, I want to grow, and you're holding me back, but it's not a sin. But you're holding this... The, you choose this unwise, and, and the, I've got lots of work here. I don't always choose the wisest. I often throw a lot of Lee in there. Lee wants this. And Lee wants that. Lee wants this now. Is it a sin? No, but Lee still wants this now. When is it best? No, I'm guilty. Every time I do that, that's a little subtle way, if not a huge way. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's about the spirit. Not following the New Testament pattern of work and worship and organization of the local congregation. Oh, that's a lot of stuff in there. Not doing what they did. <coughs> the word, <coughs> examine everything carefully. Now listen, hold fast to that which is good. Huh, that word is used over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's see, verse 1, be imitators. Mimic is the word. Be imitators, just as also I am of Christ. Now I praise you. Because you remember me in everything and you hold fast. Same word. The traditions. Well, here it's talking about at least hair length, if not also some kind of artificial covering. But I understand it to be hair length and that's it. I could be wrong. But there's some tradition that's being taught here. And is when you're, if you just reject them, 
Well, we got, we got problems here. Do any of you remember what the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians really are dealing with? The first four? What's the first one? You got the first one chapter? First one chapter. <laughs> Divisions. That's the first four, actually. He doesn't stop until chapter four. Right in the middle there, chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? You, plural. It's talking to the church. Y'all are the temple of God. Y'all, plural, <coughs> are singular, the temple. He's talking to the church here. Y'all is southern, folks. <laughs> Did I butcher it? What you, yeah, okay, so, do you not know that you are the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, he is quenching the Spirit. Well, it doesn't say he's quenching the Spirit, but he destroyed the temple of God. Chapter 12, concerning spiritual gifts, uh, which are from the Spirit. I know. So all the years of study have got me that far. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that all of you spoke in tongues, but even more, that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive the Spirit not being quenched. All I do, these gifts back then, so you walk into this assembly, you walk into back then, you're suddenly in the first century in Corinth, and you got a whole bunch of people, or one, it doesn't matter how many, speaking in tongues without, interpre without interpretation. And here, the guy, you can't understand it. There's no interpretation. And over here is a prophet who can actually speak a language that you understand, and he doesn't get to talk because the one speaking in tongues without an interpreter is talking. What's happening? The spirit is being quenched. They're not being built up. The spirit is being quenched. Verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble? Each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for the opposite of the... So let all things be done for the spirit burning. <coughs> if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three. Each in turn must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let them <coughs> pass judgment. But if a revelation is made... To another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, and all the churches of the saints. My whole point in turning here is, it matters what we do when we're assembled. Who wants to let the spirit grow? So then let's do things their way. That's Oh, just do anything. No, no. We have to do things their way. For example, uh, let me just ask a quick question in here. Are there any smart women in the room today? Husbands, raise your hands. <laughs> raise your hands. Raise your hands. Right, yeah, we got some smart women in here. Right. And, and I learn. I learn. But listen. The women are to keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves to the law. If they desire to... Okay, here we have this church assembled. Now we can learn from women. Yes, obviously we can, but not in this setting. Somehow, God has determined it that, well, when you're in this setting, if the smart one talks, you're actually quenching the spirit. I don't know why. <laughs> Ask God. Verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or of the spirit, spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not. So my whole point here is, look, it matters what we do when we're, it matters what we do in our personal lives. I do not want to quench the spirit. It matters what I do in my personal life. It matters what we do together. And that's why I get up here and I preach out of the text, and you get up here and you preach out of the text, and at home we have Bible studies from the text, trying to encourage each other to do the text so that we will become 
Now, having said that, at the same time, we can have a mechanical average. We come in here, we check everything. We've done it right. We've done it right. Do we have to do it right? Yes. Is that all there is to it? No. no. <laughs> Doing it right includes having the right attitude while we're in here. And while we're out <coughs> here. Comments? It's a mouthful there. I guess I spoke quickly because I covered that faster than I thought it would. <laughs> How about not shepherding? In Acts chapter 28, chapter 20, verse 28, who had made the shepherds the shepherds of that local congregation? Who had made? Do you remember? So Acts 20. Verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my, come, my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. But you was not, you're supposed to stop it. You shepherds, you bishops, you overseers, you elders, go in and do your work. And if you don't do your work, well, then you're snuffing out, you're extinguishing the spirit. At the same time, from last week, brethren, appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you and give instruction to you that you esteem them very highly. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look, shepherds, do your work, and those who are being shepherded, esteem them. Otherwise, you're holding them back. Who wants, you know, this song? <coughs> Listen to the language and the feeling it is trying to provoke in you. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of darkness, shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set me free by the truth you now bring us. All of these words are designed to provoke emotion. And we get done singing this song and we say, Oh, I feel great. Blaze, spirit, blaze. Really. It's a lot more than a feeling, folks. It's the nitty-gritty. You want the spirit to blaze in your life? I do. I want to feel it too. But it begins with doing this work day in, day out. Not all of it. I'm so thrilled to do, but I need to become thrilled to do. Sometimes, sometimes the spirit blazing involves getting some of the stuff like in Hebrews 12, like you mentioned. Getting some of that stuff, getting some of that gunk out. That's part of the spirit blazing, and sometimes that stuff hurts too. So, even if it's not the sin, you know, like the the, the stuff that gunk holds you back. is not sin. <laughs> <laughs> I use but, gunk in my radio. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's painful, but it's it, physically or emotionally or whatever. But it's it's worth it. Painful. Mm -hmm. That painful doesn't feel good. Who wants some pain today? <laughs> right. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 1 <coughs> verse 6. He writes to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity but of power and love and discipline. Timothy had some gift. We don't know what it is. But it was a gift. And what apparently had he let happen? Or to state it negatively, what hadn't he been doing? Using it. Kindle afresh. <coughs> Start using it again. I don't care if it was just the last minute he stopped using it. Paul is telling him, you've got to use this. Use it or lose it. You've got to use this, Timothy. The Spirit is in you, and this way is some miraculous way, just specific and miraculous. Timothy, the Spirit wants to work in you. It wants to burn in you. Galatians 5. Verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit. 
Now, this is not miraculous. But this is what the Spirit wants, is love. Who wants the Spirit to burn in them? Get along. Even when they're being mean and dirty, rotten, nasty to you. Or they're just not even being nice to you. You want the Spirit to burn? Love. Joy. Truck breaks down on the side of the road on the way home to Connecticut. What are you going to do? You want the Spirit to burn in you? You're going to have joy. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self. Oh. Self-control? I want another bowl of ice cream. Or whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with ice cream. Maybe it's something bad. I, I, there's that picture on the internet. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. I don't want that. You want the spirit to burn in you. Then you're, you're, I'm not going to be that old person. If we live by the spirit, let us, all, let us also walk by the spirit. Okay. Comments or questions on that. Now we kind of beat that to uh, a pulp, but I think we could spend a, probably another six or seven weeks on it if we wanted to. Comments or questions? I think we could also know when we are quenching the Spirit because the, it can be participating in our, in our, in our lives with uh, how we are living our lives if we're not in prayer our if we're not humbling ourselves before God. Uh, James, a uh, continuation in James chapter 4, goes into that and tells them that you must humble yourself and let God exalt you. You know, um, if we're not in His Word, if we're neglecting His Word, if we're just complaining and whining and uh, asking everybody else for their opinions, Instead of seeking God's word, we are telling God that I've got something better to do, or I don't know if you can answer this, or if you can do this, you know, that's quenching the spirit as well. Because if we aren't following and, and doing his work, how can he grow how can the spirit of God grow in us? He can't. Yeah, we've right. extinguished it, it. it. And people, you know, in some religious groups, they think that the spirit is a great feeling. And that's not always the, the, the truth. Because the thing is, is when we're studying, and Jesus has said, uh, he who, uh, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, that he shall be filled, or he shall be satisfied. You know, when we're studying the Word, when we're in the Word, <coughs> we're praying for brothers and sisters, we're praying for the sinners. You know, the Spirit is not being... <coughs> you said blessed is He... You said two things. You said a lot. Two things. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Have you ever... Oh, thank you. Have you ever had an inkling... You know what? I, I want to sit down and read my Bible for... Just a minute. And not done it. Another one of those profound questions. Right? Yeah. How many times have you done it? Well, I'm not suggesting that every time you have the inkling that you must sit down. But I'm saying, if you develop this pattern, look, your spirit was saying, I want to go to God. Well, one way to help that grow is then to pick up the word and start reading it. That's, that's a match made. Also, prayer... If we're not praying, we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Yes, if we're praying. If we're not praying, in this context, the Spirit isn't interceding for you because you're not praying. That's when here. So we need to be careful of these. Okay. First Thessalonians. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Very quickly. There is a doctrine which is often summarized with this acronym TULIP. That's not our, that's not my acronym, that's their acronym. Total Hereditary Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace. 
perseverance of the saints. The irresistible grace is, look, we're born in sin. That's number one. Born in sin. So we can't do anything to be saved. Jesus only died for the elect. And those who will be saved, because we cannot do anything to be saved, you can't even want to be saved. Because of that, God, when He saves you, it's because He wants His Spirit to move on you and you cannot stop it. Because if God wants something done, guess what's going to happen? It's going to get done. In other words, if God wants to do something, He's more powerful than you are. You can't stop Him. That's the argument. Does God want His Spirit to grow? But yet, what does this text say? Do not quench the Spirit. Well, if what God wants always happens and you can't stop it, then this commandment makes no sense. Do not quench the Spirit. I'm telling you that even though you can't quench the Spirit. That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't make sense. In 1 Thessalonians 5, <coughs> we can stop the Spirit. Here we can. Do not quench the Spirit implies you can quench the Spirit. I, I don't know how we get out of that. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, for example, doesn't in lots of places, you are chosen in verse 1. Verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And so the argument First 1 Peter is, look, God chose you, the Spirit does it, you can't do anything, you're, He's God, you're you, you can't stop it. The argument that they make. Yes, that's the argument they make, exactly. Well, then apply that over here. It, it, just, it doesn't make sense. The same with perseverance of the saints. The perseverance is, we sometimes say once saved, always saved. The argument is, among others, from John 17. In John 17, Jesus prays, keep them from Satan, keep them from Satan. God, Father, keep them from Satan. That's what Jesus' will is. Verse 24, John 17, 24, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, be with me. Okay, if that's what Jesus desires, and what Jesus wants happens, then they will be. It doesn't matter what the saint does. The saint can sin. The saint can <coughs> sin. Yes. The saint can sin. But Jesus wants him to be saved, and so he will be saved no matter what he wants. Well, again, examine everything carefully. Do not quench the Spirit. God wants the Spirit not to be quenched, but yet <coughs> he can thwart his will. I, I don't understand how being consistent we can say yes in one spot and no in the other. Go ahead. John. Very, very, very slightly off topic. Do Calvinists believe in free will outside of religious matters? Uh, it depends. There's the range. You know, Some will say, no, everything's predetermined. Others will say, no, there's free will. Okay, because I just... All of it's nuts anyway, but just, just the idea that you know, we, we can't do anything about this. And if we can't Basically, do anything about this, then why are we here? Why are we, why are we here? Logically, it's inconsistent. It's, it's not cohesive. Because you were predetermined to be here is really the only answer. <laughs> right. and, and, you know. and if you sin, you were predetermined yeah. to sin, which makes God the author of sin. John, John, John Moore. I was going to say, that's why we're supposed to test all things. If I have an idea, and I bring it forth, we need to test that make sure it's uh, true in the scriptures. Right. All the scripture. Not just, I could pick one little tiny verse out here and say this is <coughs> all inclusive, but it may not be anything. Yeah, and, and, and I granted, I may have done that in my text today. If I have, let me know because I'm a teacher. I do not want to teach what is false, but at the same time I'm going to examine everything. Uh, I was going to say, to me if Calvinism is true, then the whole thing everything is just a one cosmic marionette show, you know. God is God controlling everything. everything. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to God allows some things. And yet he's still in control. At home, I'm in control, but I allow a lot. I allow my children to make mistakes. Sometimes I'll watch my children. I'll tell them, no, don't do that. And then I'll watch them do it on purpose. So I can set them up for, Jack, you should have listened to me. But I, mean, I could have stopped them, but I didn't. No, I'm not saying I'm God, but the... the, the uh, yes. In regards to our inability to stop God kind of thing, um, this wouldn't make sense to a Calvinist person, but in the way... Like, we can, we can, 
we can stop his mercy, <coughs> but we can't stop his justice. So yeah. there's still a part of you know his spirit, whatever that, that we, <coughs> we try to do. We, we, we can't quench that. That will burn literally. You know, if if we don't make sure I say this right, if we do quench the yeah, yeah. the yeah. other part of it. Okay. We'll go ahead and move on from here. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. From verse 4 was a whole bunch of radical changes. What they have been used to, they're used to fornicating with just anybody, especially the men. And he says, no, stop that. What? And it's not easy. All right. Um, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend your own business, and work with your hands. Again, in that culture, culture, what? And everybody's, you, you know, you're you're acting like a slave, like a poor man. Yeah. Is that easy to do? In the, in every, no, that's not easy. All these things, which he says, love one another. <laughs> what? <laughs> easy? I got to put up with Richie sometimes. Every once, every three months, he comes up and visits, and, and it's difficult, and he's got to put up with me. Is it easy? May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. All I know, not all I know, but I know this. I don't have to fight this fight on my own. <coughs> May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Are we going to make mistakes? <coughs> May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look, when I am done, I've tried to follow this. I've tried, but I have made a lot of mistakes. And guess what? No matter how hard I've tried, I've made mistakes, and my salvation is by grace. grace. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that's going to get me into the kingdom is His grace. I try, I fail. When I failed the very first time, many years ago, ever since then, my salvation is by grace. And that's it. But... It is by grace, and faithful is he who calls you, and he will bring it to pass. <coughs> He'll bring it to pass. Look, it's by grace. We make mistakes, but guess what? As long as we stay in his grace and his mercy, he'll bring it to pass. God calls us. It begins with justification and initial sanctification. That is being set apart. The word sanctify literally means, the root of it is just to make separate. I'm going to take it and put it over here. It's separate. It continues with purification or ongoing sanctification, which basically means the result of your sanctification. Look, in, we already read this. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is your set-apartness. What is the will of God? Your sanctification, your set-apartness. That is... You abstain from sexual immorality. You see, here's the set of partners, and what will flow from it, what will result from it, is also called your sanctification. So it begins with initially, God says, I'm sanctifying you. Thank you, God. It continues with purification. I'm going to stay away from this, and I'm going to do this. And it ends with glorification. Who wants to go to be glorified? Where are we right now? Right there. Is it easy? No. But with God's help and because of His grace, we'll get down here eventually. Brian? It is a, a, a life process. We obey the gospel. When we place our faith and, and obey God, that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from that sin sins that we have done in the past. But that doesn't mean that it's all that we're here to do. We're, we're just okay now. We can do what we want. Satan's going to come and attack us left and right and provide us with better things in our lives. Christ continues to provide us a way of escape. He provides us the chances to understand and the knowledge from His Word that we can be purified, we can continue to have our sins forgiven if we are following Him. You know, we're not working our way and saying, okay,
Okay, God, look at all this stuff I've done. Because at the end, it's Christ's blood that was shed for our sins. And, and grace is showing that. You know, we don't deserve it. And we still have to look at ourselves and say, you know, God, I failed. But I am so grateful and thankful for your grace and your love that you show that I don't deserve. Right. We need to be careful. You know, we emphasize, there are some that emphasize it doesn't, you can't do anything. And so that is true. You cannot do anything to, in, to earn salvation. You, you can't do anything to earn salvation. That's what we're talking about. You cannot do anything to earn. But that doesn't mean that there are not conditions to accept His grace. Okay? To accept the gift. Earning, accepting a gift. Two different things. And at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. And we're all saying, Lord, I come to you and you alone. Please accept me. I have met the conditions. And because you have promised if I meet the conditions, you will save me. I can have confidence. But it's still based on your grace, not my earning it. John? We need to focus on the momentary nature of that whole process. Not easy, but it's momentary. Yes. It's a short thing that we're going to go through. Yeah. Um, sanctify you entirely. So basically this is saying, uh, you guys remember this word uh, in the Old Testament, consecrate the idea has to do with filling your hand the priest literally the word is fill your hand priests I'm going to fill your hands and we have the, we understand the metaphor because if our hands are full with one thing then we cannot do anything else that's that's the metaphor behind it okay I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God your spiritual service of worship your body, that, that's uh, everything, <coughs> right? All your time, all your thoughts, all your emotions, all your power, everything you have, dedicate to God, right? That's why he'll say here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Not just Sundays, not just Sundays and Thursdays, not just when I'm with my family, so on and so forth. No, my life is dedicated to him. Here's another one. Um, we are taking some of our thoughts captive to the obedient, obedience of Christ. If you know your New Testament, you know that I just totally butchered it. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Wow. I have a lot of work to do. Comment or question? So, faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. This is where we are, folks. We're in a progress of a process of, of, of coming from dirt and mud to being less stained dirt and mud. But we're in there somewhere, and I'm asking God, you said, remember Philippians chapter 1? I have no doubt, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. Look, all of you, have confidence. Look, we're saved by His grace, and I want to be a better person. And as long as I stick with God, He'll make me into that better person. So be patient with yourselves. God's being patient with you. Be patient with yourselves. Greet a brethren, pray for us. Greet all brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord. Have this letter read to all brethren. I adjure you. This is His word for I'm making you swear. Not curse. I adjure you by the Lord. Why would he have to say that so strongly? I'm guessing some people didn't want to hear it. That is true. Some people don't want to hear it. Could you imagine? And now I'm talking about other people. What about me? <coughs> Brian? It just shows how God wants these letters and the Bible which we have today to be spread and shared with others. Even though it was written to a, congreg a specific congregation or in some letters to several congregations, 
Um, that word needs to be spread because this is not just man's word. I'm not just writing a letter that is saying something. This is important for everyone so that they may understand what God's will is. So that we may walk in a matter worthy in his ways. Yeah, there are uh, uh, many so different there are many different implications from this or consequences. One of them would be if nobody reads the words that when Jesus comes back he can't be glorified in his saints. I don't want to be mixed up. Uh, verse 26 said, Brethren, uh, greet all brethren with a holy kiss. Clement of Alexandria, who was around uh, 200 or so B.C. A.D., complains of those who make the churches resound with their kissing. <laughs> Such abuses led to restrictions and, for example, the apostolic constitutions of the 4th century direct men to kiss men and women to kiss women. Anything can be abused. So we have to have diligence to make sure that we don't take something <coughs> of God's word, do it, and pervert it. We need to stop here for now. Any last comment or question? Thank you for your work. We'll break till right on the hour.